Welcome to this episode of the Disease Du Jour podcast on the topic of new thoughts on old dermatologic diseases with Ann Rashmir, DBM, MS, DACVS. I'm your host, Kim Brown, publisher of Equimanagement. The Disease Du Jour podcast is brought to you in 2021 by Merck Animal Health. Dr. Rashmir, who's self-employed in the Washington, D.C. area, is a board-certified surgeon. She received her DVM from the University of California, Davis, and did her equine surgery residency at Kansas State University. She has an interest in dermatology, and her research has included heritable equine regional dermal asthenia, or HERDA. Included in her job history is 10 and a half years as an associate professor, large animal clinical sciences, at the Michigan State University College of Veterinary Medicine, and is the current equine program manager of the Western Veterinary Conference, a title she has held for eight years. Welcome, Dr. Rashmir. Thank you so much, Kim. It's good to see you again. It's good to see you too. So let's just jump right in. What dermatologic problems do you think the average practitioner in the field might encounter? So look, I, what I'd love to do is sort of divide it into sections. Um, I think allergic disease is still a big problem in horses. Uh, we're getting out of that time of year a little bit, depending on where you live in the country, but still a, a big problem overall. Uh, skin tumor is always a problem. Um, and then talking about a couple of those, maybe some new things on the horizon and, and available now. Um, I'd like to just br briefly touch on some allergic causes, sorry, some um, infectious causes of skin diseases in horses, both uh, bacterial causes, and then maybe take a little bit more time and talk about some of the parasitic diseases, um, such as Oncocerca and Habronema. Um, mites, always a, a big problem for anybody who sees draft horses or even other horses too. So how about that for a start today? Well, that sounds great. Well, why don't we start with allergic diseases? Because even though, you know, we are winding down, you know, for some of the pests that maybe cause some of this, we do have Florida and Texas and California. Absolutely. They warm all year. Absolutely. And you're absolutely right. When we talk about allergic disease, really, we are most commonly talking about the budding flies, still the number one cause of allergic disease in the horse, uh, the budding insects. So anyway, look, here, here there are a couple of new things um, that are being done and used and worth trying in selecting their, um, allergic horses. Um, one, one of the newer things on the horizon came from the small world and that's Apoquil, which has been used for quite a while to treat itchiness in uh, dogs and, and even in cats. Um, new in the horse, I think a lot of people were, were under the impression it would not make it to the horse world because can be a little bit pricey, but it turns out the way the horse is dosed, it's not really that bad. So it might be useful, um, at least in select cases. The dose for that that I use anyway, um, and, uh, published in a, a um, abstract, is uh, 0.25 milligrams per kilogram once daily for 28 days. Um, usually takes a few days to work, maybe up to five days to work. And um, that's about seven to nine of the biggest dog sized tablets, that, which is 60 milligrams uh, per horse. And that was uh, an abstract published at the ACBIM in uh, 2020. So I think there's maybe a little bit of a mixed review for it. It's certainly not like steroids, uh, you know, which we've used really um, almost exclusively for itchiness in horses, <laughs> maybe a little bit of banned histamines too. But I think um, in the select horse, it's going to be worth trying. The other thing that is sort of new, um, that's been around for a while, but as it turns out, a lot of horses with hives actually have a little bit um, of complement, which is um, one of the inflammatory uh, mediators actually. And um, so the hives actually have a, a complement base, at least in some horses, like, a, like in humans and dogs. And so we can actually use Adequan for hives or Petisan for hives. I generally use the same um, dose of penicillin or Adequan as I would for treating arthritis uh, in Adequan. That's 500 milligrams per horse every three days. Uh, and it's labeled for seven treatments. Um, the dose for penicillin is 30 milligrams per kilogram every five to seven days. And it's labeled for four treatments. So uh, you might try, particularly in the horses where like, dexamethasone might not be something that would be as safe. Um, we always worry about dexamethasone in horses that have 
PPID or you have had previous episodes of laminitis, horses that are overweight. So you might try the adequan, not quite as quick as the steroid, but does seem to be at least steroid sparing. It's interesting, we also started using adequan and penicillin in horses with pemphigus and um, have seen some good results. So um, the other thing I did wanna just cover, don't forget all those good old fashioned things about allergies, just purely bathing the horse. Seriously, even for bug bites. Um, we do know that just like in humans and in dogs, horses process most of their allergens through their skin and possibly even the horses that have respiratory allergens like, like asthma horses. But for sure, the, all the dermatologic ones are through the skin. And so just bathing the horse with at least some frequency in a mild shampoo, definitely worth your time. Old, old fashioned, yes, but worth it. I would caution, and I see a fair amount of people bathing at the racetrack, actually, in things like Dawn detergent um, to you know, really get the horse clean. But what that does, as, as you might remember, it, is it strips the fatty layers that are out of part of the skin, and then that actually makes the horse more susceptible to both infectious and allergic disease, because that fat layer, those ceramides and fatty acids and all, are really important for that skin barrier to stay healthy. So mild shampoo is the way to go, and if you've got a good quality colloidal oatmeal shampoo, even better for those allergic horses. Um, the other thing too, uh, I would tell you that I love mosquito magnets. You know, you can buy them now, like the ones that are on golf courses for about $250 off of Amazon. And you reload them, it depends on I think which ones you buy, but you can reload them up to once a month. And it depends a little bit on which mosquitoes are out, but it can really do a lot for those barns that have horses that they want to protect from, from mosquitoes. And, and mosquitoes are a big problem for some horses, as you know. Yeah, they're a big problem where we irrigate. I think Wyoming being high desert, we irrigate so much that the mosquitoes here are, are pretty tough. Oh, yeah. Oh, but, you know, I was surprised. Um, some of the worst mosquitoes I've encountered in my life were in Minnesota. And I would have thought, yeah, and they were wicked. I mean, really wicked. I, I spent a lot of time in both the South, like in Mississippi, and then also in California. But yeah, you know, it's uh, mosquitoes are um, are sort of interesting, aren't they? They really are. And bad for bad for horse skin. Um, what do you think? Should we move along to um, some tumors? Yeah, let's talk a little bit about horse tumors. I mean, that's always something that that vets are going to run into in the field. Absolutely. So, you know, one of the things that I like to sort of recall because of, um, or any, and maybe even remind people of, is that uh, sarcoids, we, we think of sarcoids as, oh, you know, sarcoids, but it's cancer. You know, it really is cancer. And I think a lot of the old uh, sort of thoughts on small sarcoids were to just, if they were slow growing, we would just watch them. And as it turns out, there's more and more evidence that we should get the, rid of them sooner rather than later and watching not necessarily recommended anymore. Um, and this comes from multiple publications where uh, um, pretty much every in every study that ever looked, smaller sarcoids were more amenable to treatment, almost no matter what treatment, than larger sarcoids. So the smaller, the better if you really wanna get rid of them. Okay, so that's one. And two, there are a couple of little studies where the ones that had not been there as long were also easier to get rid of. So I think we need to maybe seriously rethink, particularly with, with what we have at our, um, in part of our arsenal now for treatment of sarcoids, a lot of the chemotherapeutics like, like cisplatin beads are back on the market now and, and probably better than they had been for a while. Um, so easy to drop one single bead in a, a horse for with a small sarcoid. And, um, you know, that could be the end of it then potentially. Might have to come back and rebead that horse one more time, but usually for a small sarcoid, that's enough and very affordable and one less thing the client has to worry about and, and you as a veterinarian, because if that horse stays in your practice and that sarcoid gets bigger, <laughs> which um, some, some of you um, of my age might, might have had a couple of those things happen, you start to kick yourself, you didn't say something a little sooner. But, um, but, anyway, um, but anyway, new thinking is get rid of the small ones, quit, quit watching. And when we think about cancer in general, right again, like, who really wants to watch cancer get bigger, even if it is slow growing? So well, there you go. A little bit maybe to some of the younger veterinarians who maybe haven't done beating. 
explain yeah. this plant. Very simple. Um, basically, it's a bead that's in a, a gel it's, uh, manufactured by a company called Royer Biomedical. And they've been on the market. Look, I used them probably 30 years ago for the first time before I think they were even sold. I think um, one of the pilot um, projects was probably back then. And anyway, so they're in a slow release gel. And so when we think about chemotherapy in horses, a lot of times we think about like local injections. We're worried about contamination in the environment. And when you think about injecting things under pressure, because sarcoids have what we call high tumor pressure, so they're very firm. And so it's sort of hard to inject and you can get those sort of blowout sort of things with chemotherapy getting on you or the horse elsewhere or the property. Um, and we try to minimize that clearly. And um, uh, really, there was a really lovely publication about who rides horses, right? And for the most part, it's women, right? And a lot of it, it are, uh, a lot of the people that ride are women of childbearing ages or younger, right? Girls, kids. And so just keeping those environments clean where those horses are boarded, very important, right? And then, um, you know, the um, people that regulate, um, you know, health and all have, have come up with some ideas about what you really need to wear when you actually use chemotherapy and how to dispose of things. And we know that um, just cleaning up with 10% bleach can actually do a lot if you happen to have an external spill. So all those things are great, but um, the beat itself is not going to basically go flying off in the air. <laughs> Thank goodness. So really what you do is put on a flat sarcoid that are just beautiful for flat sarcoids. Um, every centimeter and a half, you make, make a stab incision. I actually place the suture to close that right then and there because occasionally um, you'll find that as you go to suture close after you put the bead in, the needle for the suture pushes that bead back out. Very frustrating when it lands on the ground. So anyway, I just put the suture in, put the bead in, then just tie the suture. Um, yeah. And, you know, very simple, straightforward. Uh, we do sedate some of those horses. Some of them, we just do a, a block, you know, lidocaine block for the right horse and one that's eating generally or distracted some other way just block far away from the tumor because we don't, you know, those, those have an underlying papillomavirus um, uh, etiology. So we don't want to drag that virus to the tissue. So if you block those, generally I block way far away, pa past the centimeter margin out, you know, the, not going to bother the horse, a little bit of carcane. Um, and um, some people prefer to block directly into the tumor. You can actually do that as well. There's not a whole lot of evidence to show that um, it's going to change the way the bead eludes the, the agent, but just in case, I, I tend to be on the safe side of block far away. Anyway, um, so should we talk about melanomas or what? what? Yeah, let's talk about melanomas and, and okay. help help maybe some of, again, some of the younger vets or other understand that, you know, the sarcoids and the melanomas, they can be confusing sometimes. It is, you know, so, um, um, so there are lots of different schools of thought about melanomas, okay, from, but there have been some beautiful reviews on melanomas. And um, we do know that we really can't always predict which melanomas are going to become a problem for the horse. But we do know that a horse that's gray is a much higher likelihood of getting, getting melanomas and that they tend to increase with age. And so, you know, one of the frustrating things is when we have a, a horse that's just doing its job beautifully, 10, 12, 15 years of age, right? We want to get every little day out of that horse, right? In the most comfortable way uh, for the horse and for the rider. <laughs> and so one of the things that gets frustrating is when the horse starts having problems during that period of time, be them lameness, be them skin tumors. Melanomas can get bad enough that they actually end up um, cause for the horse colicking and dying. They can be bad enough that, you know, they can obstruct the horse's ability to urinate or defecate. Um, they can metastasize to it, bad bad melanomas, not the not the average melanoma, but a bad melanoma can metastasize to lymph nodes and they're on farther um, further areas. So it is something that if the owner has a horse um, that is starting to have melanomas, particularly in my opinion, those that at a little younger age, that onset vaccine um, does work very well. Um, the I've not seen the publication yet, but I um, have read it actually. And um, there's really good evidence that it works. I've actually used quite a bit of it now myself. It does uh, in, in my hands um, also have a significant effect in keeping those tumors from growing. 
shrinking some of them, um, actually, that are already there. And um, the expert for that is a guy named Jim Blackford, who has done a, a lot of tumors. So before they get to be out of control, I think it's a really good choice, that onset vaccine. The other things that we know about uh, melanomas, they may be, uh, may, may be worthwhile trying some peroxicam on those uh, tumors. It's usually about an 80 milligram per horse dose, 90 milligram per horse dose. Uh, horses eat it extremely well. It's a non -steroidal. I don't use it when I use but or banamine or anything like that um, because we don't want to load up on non because you can cause more problems with the GI tract or kidney, as you know. And, um, and it actually probably butte works as well, too, for the horses that are actually already on butte. It's a non-specific H2. So um, the horses that are not on butte, uh, Proxicam is a, a good choice. Um, very affordable. Most horses eat it. And a lot of horses won't eat butte, as you as you know. So again, can actually help quite a bit with, with both squamous cells and also with um, melanoma. That's great. Yeah. So I guess it brings us now to um, our next topic, which was going to be uh, forms of infectious causes of yeah. skin disease. Okay. So let's talk about the parasites first, because it's still a parasite season in a lot of places. Um, and I did want to talk about one thing in particular, which I think is sort of, we created as veterinarians, but in a good way, and that's onchocerciasis. You know, onchocerciasis uh, back in the old days was like very disfiguring and, and really sort of horrific. Um, I don't see that type of onchocerciasis anymore. What I see are the horses who just don't have enough hair on their face. You know, they start to basically lose their facial hair, sometimes around their eyes, sometimes around their muzzles. I don't mean, you know, foals that are, that are actually just shedding out sort of thing. I mean, you know, adult horses. And what I believe has happened is since we've really done a much better job of deworming practices by deworming by fecal egg counts, so that's where we, we do the egg counts on the feces. We don't deworm the horses that have low fecal egg counts, but we deworm the horses that have high fecal egg counts. Um, so we preserve that refugia. What's happened is um, I think we've created a little bit more onchocerciasis in the world because if we're not using one of the ivermectins or moxidectins as a dewormer, um, we're not getting those microfilaria killed. And so sometimes when, it, and you'll see it um, in, in um, any horse that does hair loss, sometimes when the horse does get dewormed, ever hasn't been dewormed for a while, we'll see um, a big flare up. The horse's face watch kind of swell. And that's because they've got a pretty dang good load of those microfilaria being killed. And so when you start to see the, the beginnings of maybe some hair loss on those horses, and I don't mean the horses with like dermatophilosis sort of hair loss where it's crusting and all that, but just, you know, less hair than you would expect, particularly on the face. Um, that might be a time to think about onchocerciasis. Today's Disease Du Jour podcast is brought to you by Merck Animal Health, the maker of prestige vaccines, Banamine, Panicure, Regimate, Protozil, and other trusted equine health solutions. Merck Animal Health works for you and for horses. Learn more about Merck Animal Health's comprehensive portfolio of products as well as their ongoing investment in our industry, profession, and community through programs such as the Respiratory Biosurveillance Program at MerckAnimalHealthUSA.com. That's a good so, point. Worth, a, worth a doing on those. Um, some other things, too. We ought to talk about pinworms. Pinworms have been around forever. <laughs> Cause of much butt rubbing. <laughs> Tail hair loss, you know, uh, and quite honestly, think of it, uh, um, I actually think of a lot of these things uh, that we're talking about, like allergic disease and um, pinworms and things, as welfare issues. Because really, can you, can you imagine being so allergic you rub your hair out? Yeah. I mean, really. I mean, poor horses. I, I think we, we need to sometimes appeal to owners, um, particularly the horses that have like the um, chelicoides hypersensitivity that rub their mane and tail out. That's a horse that really needs help from us as veterinarians. But anyway, um, pinworms, occasionally I'll read where pinworms, if people think pinworms have become resistant um, to dewormers, and really it's probably not the case. Um, if you are familiar at all with, with human pinworms, it's usually in children, you know, toddlers, that sort of thing, preschoolers, uh, kindergarten, that sort of thing. 
And what happens there is it's a lot of husbandry that goes into the problem, right? So if you think about um, that in, in humans, all the bedding would be washed for the child, all the clothes that recently worn would be washed. And usually everybody in the family would be dewormed as well along with the child. Yeah. And so I think we're expecting a lot of any dewormer if we think we can just give the dewormer and not do something for the environment. So what I think is actually not resistance of the pinworm is probably just not taking care of the environment. So what I generally recommend to clients is, um, so they dorm the horse, they I actually like the idea of um, a little bit of mineral oil over the horse's perineum. Okay, so perirectal up, you know, up the tail a little bit, down the um, areas rec adjacent to the rectum and a little bit down the legs. I put a little mineral oil on that, just let it sit for just a few minutes, even five minutes or so, and then rinse with a mild shampoo. What that does, it loosens up all those eggs at those pinworms have laid and are gooey and sticky there. And um, then you can actually get rid of them. And that does a lot to clean the environment. If you can clean additional parts of the environment, it's hard, like certainly you're not gonna be cleaning up the pasture for that horse, but maybe there's something in the stall where the horse typically yeah. rubs their butt. And frequently there is, you know, sometimes it's a stall door. And if you can just even wash that down with some, you know, soapy water, you can do a lot to um, minimize that horse's tail rubbing. Yeah. So definitely good. worth it. Very good tip. Um, let's talk a little bit about mites. For anybody that sees draft horses, and it doesn't always have to be draft horses, but that's the one that really seemed to be the most problematic uh, for me and other veterinarians that do a fair amount of, of uh, horse work. And um, I used to use a lot of frontline on those, um, which I have shied away from now because when I have used in the past, those horses get very um, uncomfortable, at, like in front of your eyes. And I thought maybe because it stung, you know, I've gotten frontline on media, unfortunately, but um, it's like it stings and all. I, I don't know if it makes something with the behavior of the mites different, that maybe they burrow more. I don't know, but a lot of those horses would stomp their feet. And anybody that's done that to a horse that's had mites will probably tell you the same thing. They, you know, they stomp, they get agitated, that sort of thing. Maybe it does burn in some way that I don't understand. So I've actually gone to something that I actually like quite a bit better, and that's a topical, it's epinomectin. Oh. And really nice study on epinomectin. Um, um, the, the author's name is URAL, URAL maybe. Okay. Um, and the article was first published a long time ago, like 2008, but I don't know that's really caught on. Um, anyway, it's a 500 um, microgram per kilogram body uh, weight uh, dose. And, um, you know, basically it's like a, a treat, like a, a small um, cow <laughs> sort of dose. Um, and their study, they used it for um, a different mite than the standard ones that you'll see. Coreopteus is, is the mite that we see most commonly in draft horses, but we can see others as well. But it works on any mite. So it goes on the top of the horse, down the horse's back, on the top line, stay away from those legs that are already maybe a little bit aggravated and seems to do a really nice job. Occasionally, I've, I've retreated those horses two and three times, um, but it does seem to do a lot to clear things up. The other problem with mites, uh, I used to think that horses that had allergies to mites or problems with mites had a big light, big load of mites. Yeah. And so I would find them on scraping. So if I didn't find them, I would think, oh, it's probably not mites. Well, as it turns out, it's probably more like flea allergy dermatitis in dogs, where one flea can set a dog off, you know, typical hot spot on the tail head area. So it really doesn't take much. Mites are, we, we know, really um, a little allergenic sort of species. You know, think of the dust mites. We know that rosacea in, in humans and women in particular, um, probably to some extent caused by demodex a mite. So a lot of the treatments now are aimed at getting rid of the mite uh, there. And again, just creates a lot of inflammation. So um, anyway, it probably really takes like just a few, very few mites and you're not gonna necessarily get that on skin scraping. I have on some, some situations where I, they, they look like they might have mites and they got the typical sort of, you know, feathers and, and the skin is uh, very upset and unhappy underneath it. I have on occasion got lots of mites, but the times that I don't, I don't then think, oh, there's no way it's mites. I think I'm going to try the epidermectin, see if I get anywhere with it. And then if so, you know, treat so that I get rid of the, the mites um, throughout the mites life cycle. So you're basically not just getting reinfected again. Yeah. So 
anyway, I think that's a, a, a one of my favorite tips so far for um, for mites. Uh, some of the other things that we were going to talk about were um, Herbenemiasis um, is a disease that's been around a long time. Lots of it in Florida. I mean, Florida is like the the Habernema haven, I would say, uh, probably because they have the the moisture, you know, the grasses that help support it, uh, lots of horses, that sort of thing. The other thing that happens in Florida is a lot of horses that um, were not originated in that kind of environment, right? They're born maybe in Michigan or in Montana or, or in, um, wherever. Um, they can end up there for a show season or, you know, longer. And so they're, they have but we, we talk about um, no sort of immunocompetence for um, different parasites, right? So there's, you know, no, we've never seen it before, they're naive to it, and it can create a problem. It's sort of like um, the Icelandic horses that come over um, after they're adults. You know, they have a lot more problems with um, tucoides than ones that come before they're two. So anyway, so the horse goes, it's never been exposed to some of the things there, and um, but they just seem to be very difficult to um, treat for habernema. So it's not a new treatment, but it's one that probably is worthwhile re um, considering in those horses. Um, well, there's two of them actually. One is putting a humidifier in the barn. Sounds strange. Why would we put a humidifier in the barn in Florida? Because it's pretty dang humid already. But we do know that the flies that actually are associated with habernema, um, we do know that they um, attracted to moist areas, which is why they end up around the lips, around the eyes, third eyelid, um, around you know the the horse's uh, penis and sheath, that sort of thing. And so, adding a, a humidifier actually can actually track the mites to a little different area. Sorry, the the flies to a little different area, and um, perhaps decrease the problems in the barn. So, in certain barns, um, might be worthwhile. Um, the other thing that we should probably mention is the di uh, dithylcarbamazine, DEC, which has been around forever, but it's sort of kind of fallen off the radar for treatment for habernema. And there are occasional times when there's just so much fibrosis that the ivermectin, I think, is, or moxidectin is, um, that we would normally use to treat it, is uh, maybe overwhelmed. And so sometimes we go with a little longer treatment with a, an oral DEC product. Um, a lot of people get that compounded for the horse. So the last thing we discussed speaking about would be um, like bacterial sort of causes of um, skin disease in horses. And look, rain rot or dermatophilosis has been around for a very long time, right? Longer than any of us. And, um, you know, some new things have sort of come to light uh, about it. One is a lot of times it's a herd outbreak. And I believe that um, we just attribute that to management or various things over the years, um, the moisture, how do you, you know, maybe it's the height of the grass and certain pastures and all that. But it turns out there's actually very likely a nutritional component to it as well. The horse is potentially marginal on whatever type of um, macronutrient or micronutrient. And so sometimes in those horses that have herd problems, um, we just add like a good broad base you know, vitamins specifically for horses, you know, um, okay, there are quite a few of them out there and it probably doesn't matter which ones, but something that's, that's really broad based, um, Vitakey or Excel Lifetime or one of those, uh, certainly there are quite a few. Um, and that surprisingly can actually do a lot for horses. The other, th yeah, so the other thing that um, has been pointed out before, sometimes it's one horse in the barn, right? And so if it's one horse in the barn, I, I generally ask the question, is there something about that horse? Is it is it an older horse? Is it possibly a little immunosenescence going on? So the horse's immune system is fading. Does it possibly have um, PPID, right, on top of it, right? Is it immunocompromised because of that? Occasionally, it's a horse that's new to the place. So, you know, sometimes it's nutritional. It didn't come, you know, fed as well as maybe the horses that are already on the place. Um, sometimes it's low man on the total pole syndrome, not quite getting nutrition and you know, maybe being a little more stressed than the other horses because it's uh, new in the area. So it is something that um, we definitely should look at a little more deeply 
instead of the old, you know, we're going to just scrub it, keep it clean, keep it dry and all that. There probably is a little bit more to it than um, was previously thought. That's very interesting because I have an old man that's like that. And, you know, he he's treated very well. I thought it was because he likes to go pick a bare spot of ground and lay down. He sleeps a lot. You know, he's always done that. He takes good yeah. care of himself. But now, you you know, he gets a good vitamin supplement, but maybe I need to go back and recheck that everything is in there that he needs. So that's a great suggestion. Does he uh, does he have any, you know, one, one thing about the PPID issues, um, you know, it's worth checking older horses. There's a fairly high percentage of horses that have it. You know, as, as you know, you get checked. Perfect. Very good. Just for the for the um, listener, and you've done exactly the right thing. And quite honestly, I knew you would have. <laughs> You're the woman. I'm sure every one of your horses is taken better care of than most horses in the world. Um, but it is true. Like we used to think of that as associated with the long hair coats, right? But something like only 10% of horses that have it have long hair coats. Right. So because there's a fairly high prevalence and, you know, up to 30%, depending on, on who you read, of horses over 15 that can have it. Um, and some of the signs aren't what we thought they were. Sometimes, um, you know, be a younger horse that's just got tendon or ligament problems. And that's actually attributed to PPID, you know. So definitely worthwhile checking um, in your older horses that are starting to have some skin issues. It can definitely, some of these things can set them up for some problems with, with any of the, 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 um, agents that can be uh, contagious. Yeah, I might need to up his vitamin E or something to boost his immune system a little bit with, with something. Pro probably worth a, a little look at anyway. Yeah. Hey, I, I know some nutrition people. Guess who I'm calling? I love but it. But that's a great point that you just made to me for veterinarians is, you know, you've got, you know, this guy, he's always had a little bit of scrub you know, when he was lived in Kentucky, it was wet. You just, you, you assume horses in, in that condition. Now he lives in a fairly dry area and has got it on his belly. And it's like, for a, you know, a horse that's changed like that, it sometimes, I think it's a great idea to bring in a nutritionist just to do a general check. That's, that's a good point. It's really interesting um, because of, I would say most clients get their nutrition information from the person who sells the feed, right? Instead of, um, which is sometimes those people are really quite talented. I don't, I don't mean to believe that at all. Um, but you know, a lot of times they they do what the company that makes the food tells them to do, right? And sometimes that's you know, not appropriate for every horse. A lot of horses probably, but not every horse. So, you know, we do know that um, as horses age, there are some things that uh, change. So, always good to to look at what they're eating. Um, Performance horses, I think, would be the other. Sometimes I, I, I'm sort of amazed sometimes what occurs, like even on, you know, nice racetracks, still back to, you know, just straight oats and grass hay. And, you know, probably not going to really end up being a, the Kentucky Derby winner with, without the, the really pushing nutrition. So there you go. But it's, it's a good point because skin is an organ. It is absolutely, yes. Organ the horse has. Yes. To remember that, you know, things that happen on the skin may be related to something else. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. You know, so when we're talking about feeding for good quality skin, too, just like, um, you know, um, but mega, mega fatty acids that we talked about for trying not to strip those horses that have allergic disease. Two really good independent studies about feeding flax to those horses. Right, because you're improving the mega fatty acid profile in those outer layers of skin, and they mount less of a, a reaction. And really well demonstrated that just just feeding flax. And some of the nutritional supplements have a flax base, and so that can actually work as well. Um, so it, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, certain specific animals in, in different parts of the country, animals at different stages through their life. Looking at nutrition, uh, um, I'm always impressed with when you make a little change. Sometimes you get a dramatic result. So yeah, a drastic result, yeah, thanks. Well, as usual, Dr. Reshmir, I'll always learn something every time I talk to you. So You're just, thank you, Kim, enjoy so talking to you. I'm, I'm hoping that our veterinary audience today has uh, found this helpful. And of course they can contact you. I know that you have a great LinkedIn profile if they can't find you anywhere else. But is there anything else that you had wanted to talk about today? I mean, we understand that there are books written about the equine dermal. <laughs> yes, yeah. 
But anything you know, else you want to touch on today? I, I would say this. Um, you know, there are a lot of good resources. And if you find something that just doesn't seem quite right, I, I would say to the, the young veterinarians and, and uh, the people out there in the trenches doing it every day, there are a lot of good resources and, um, you know, lots available. So I would just encourage to, to keep going on it. We do know that just like every other disease, the sooner you catch most of it, the better off the horse is and the better off, uh, more easy is to treat and the better you look. So there you go. Well, that's again, great advice. So thank you, Dr. Reshmir, for joining me today on this episode of Disease Du Jour. And we wanna thank our audience for listening today and a special thanks to our 2021 sponsor, Merck Animal Health. We invite all our listeners to rate our episodes of Disease Du Jour on, and hey, just check us out whether wherever you listen to podcasts, iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, or you can even just go to equimanagement.com and we have the audio file up there that you can download and listen to. And if you have any questions or suggestions for the podcast, send me an email at the letter kbrown at equinenetwork.com. The Disease Du Jour podcast is a production of the Equine Podcast Network, an entity of the Equine Network, LLC. 